Hi everyone, hope you all must be doing great. So let's start with the next part for PGBP chapter revision. In the last chapter, we were discussing uh, some of the sections which are allowed as deductions. We have already completed from section 30 till 35 uh, DDA. Last uh, section was related to VRS. We have already completed that. So let's uh, jump on to the next sections. Okay, one important announcement first that MCQs are available to you to all for all my students, including my YouTube students. You can go and you can attempt the MCQs. You can visit the website rajatmoga.com. You will find that MCQ section over there. Chapter wise MCQs are there. You can go and attempt these uh, MCQs that will be proved to be very much helpful to you. In fact, I have covered entire concept of that chapter in those MCQs, right? So as of now, some two or three chapters MCQs are available, but over the period of time within the next 10 to 12 days, I'll be uploading for all the chapters. So please start doing that MCQ practice as well. Okay. So let's start with our uh, PGBP uh, remaining sections. Uh, if you uh, look at the screen, we have already completed some of the sections. You understand in PGBP, we have section 28 to 44. 28 is the charting section, 29 was computation. And from 30 to 37 are the sections which deals with that these are the expenses which are allowed while computing your PGBB income. We have already completed section 30, 31, 32. 32 was depreciation. Section 30 was related to building. If there is any rent, repairs, taxes or insurance of building, then it is allowed under section 30. 31 is repairs and insurance of machines and furniture. 32 is depreciation. We know something about us. There are some concepts in depreciation like additional depreciation. Please remember additional depreciation is not allowed under default scheme. If your assessee is following default scheme, then additional depreciation will not be allowed. Additional depreciation is only allowed in optional scheme, right? How much is the additional depreciation? 20% of actual cost of the asset. But if the asset is used for less than 180 days, then in this year, we will allow 10% of the actual cost and remaining 10% will be allowed in next year, right? You also know about apportionment of depreciation, unabsorbed depreciation, depreciation in case of power generating unit. I, I believe that you are able to recall. We have already discussed in the last lecture also. Section 35 related to scientific research. If there is outside research, if uh, the expense is related to outside research where you contribute the amount to IIT or national laboratory or to any approved institution, association or universities. In that case, it is allowed, but not under default scheme. In default scheme, outside research is not allowed, only in-house research, right? But if you are following optional scheme, both types of uh, in-house as well as outside research is allowed, correct? 35 AD, again, if the assess is following default scheme, 35 AD, what is 35 AD? It is related to the capital expenditure, except land and financial instruments and goodwill. Other than these, if uh, assess has incurred capital expenditure on specified businesses, we have a list of 14 types of specified business. So if capital expenditure has been incurred, 100% reduction will be allowed. And also if you uh, can recall that point that if this asset which we have purchased for, uh, for a specified business purpose and if we are transferring this asset into a normal business, if we are transferring it after eight years, then we have no issues. But if we are transferring it before eight years, so whatever deduction has been taken earlier will become our PGBP income. But please don't make the entire income as PGBP. Also deemed depreciation should also be considered in that case, right? 35D and 35DDA. 35D is related to preliminary expenses. DDA was related to VRS. You understand only one fifth deduction is allowed because the and remaining four fifths will be allowed in next years in four years so uh, it is allowed in five equal installments so these were the sections which we have already discussed so let's come to section 36 section 36 is other deductions and there is a list of uh, some expenses which are allowed under section 36 if you will come to this uh, page 5.12 and i believe you have already downloaded this book it is easily available in pdf format you can download this book also from the website okay so come to section 36 36 deals with other deductions there are certain list of expenses there are certain list of expenses which are allowed under section 36 so i'll be discussing these expenses what all expenses it is mentioned on this page and next page on 5.3 it's a list of expenses very easy section very important also 
So first of all, understand that first is if you are paying insurance premium, insurance premium, let's say this insurance premium is of building, then you understand it will be covered under section 30. If you are paying insurance premium for building, it will be under 30. If the insurance premium is related to plant and machinery or furniture, section 31. But in other cases, let's say if we are paying insurance premium for our stock, then it will be covered under section 36, right? And even there are some, this, this point is not that important, but still it is covered under section 36. That is the reason I am discussing it right now. There are some federal milk cooperative societies, example is Amul. So uh, there is federal milk cooperative societies, if they are paying insurance premium for the cattles, the members owns cattle. So if we are paying insurance premium for those cattles, then that insurance premium is also allowed as a business expense and it is allowed under section 36. Not very important for examination. But this point is very important. If a CSE is having a business or profession and they are paying health insurance premium, very important point. If you have an expense related to health insurance premium, for whom? It is for their employees or even for the employee's family member, for both of them. So if we are a company, we have so many employees who are working with us. And if we have approached some insurance company, we would like to get a health insurance for our employees or for their family members also. So we have to pay insurance premium to that company, right? That would be, that would be our expense. And that is uh, treated as a business expense. It is allowed under section 36. So this point is very important. And one of the point here is again important in case of health insurance that if this health insurance, if this health insurance is paid in cash, it will not be allowed. If it is paid in cash, it will not be allowed. So this health insurance is allowed under section 36 provided it is not paid in cash. So you have to pay it through any banking mode. If you are paying it through any banking channel, then it is fine. If it is paid in cash, please, we will not allow it. So examiner can ask you this point. So please remember health insurance is allowed for the employees or their family members, but not in cash, right? Okay, this is the first point. Second point is that if you have your employees in your organization and you pay bonus to them, bonus or commission. So if you are paying bonus to them, please tell me, is it a business expense? The answer is yes, because they are our employees. We have to pay bonus also, right? Because we have to give so many things to our employees so we can pay bonus also. So if we are paying bonus to them or commission to them, that is allowed under section 36. But very important point here, bonuses and commission is allowed, but subject to section 43B, subject to section 43B. What does this mean? Because we understand what is section 43B, a very, very important section of PGBP, section 43B. Although we will discuss this section also later on, but 43B we understand. 43B has some list of expenses. It has some six or seven expenses. These about these expenses, 43B says that these expenses will only be allowed if they are actually paid by the assessee. If the assessee has not paid these expenses, we are not going to allow it. Because we understand in PGBP, there is section 145. I have taken the reference of 145 also. That is method of accounting. So we understand while computing our PGBP income and the same goes for IFOS income also. So let me keep it uh, for PGBP as of now. So if we have, if we would like to compute our PGBP income, so if there is any expense which, which is due for the year, but we have not still not paid it, it is unpaid. Can that expense be allowed? The answer is yes because it depends upon the method of accounting followed by the assessee, how the assessee is making their accounts. If they are preparing their accounts or mercantile system, then all expenses or all income will be treated on accrual basis. So that is the reason I am saying that if this bonus and commission is, uh, was the expense, what it was booked as an expense for this year, but we have not paid it. So we can say, sir, it is allowed on mercantile system basis. So we are allowing it. But section 43, we will say, no, there are certain expenses and bonus and commission is one of them. There are certain expenses irrespective of the method of accounting followed by the SSE. SSE is following uh, mercantile system or they are following cash basis. 43, we says that these expenses, there is a list of six or seven expenses. Those expenses will only be allowed if they are actually paid up to the due date of ROI that we will see in section 43b. 
So 43B has certain list of expenses. We have already done one earlier when I was telling you the first one was any type of taxes. Any type of taxes or says payable to government. If you are paying any type of tax, it could be any type of tax. So I have discussed this in uh, the section, section 30. When section 30, I was telling you in the last lecture, last to last lecture, I was telling you that municipal taxes of the building are allowed under section 30, provided they should be paid up to the due date of RY. Why? Because it is subject to 43B. So 43B has one expense, any type of taxes. Of course, they are not in income tax because income tax is not allowed. I'll tell you in section 40, small a also. Second thing is that it says, section 43B says bonus and commission. So bonus and commission can only be allowed if they are actually paid up to the due date of ROI. And if they are not paid up to the due date of ROI, it will not be allowed in this year. Are you all getting this? It will not be allowed in this year. Then it will be allowed in that year when they are actually paid. So if they are paid up to the due date of ROI, then we can allow that bonus or commission. But if it is not paid up to the due date of ROI, please don't allow it. Then when it will be allowed, it will be allowed in that year in which it is actually paid. Are you able to recall this? Okay. And another important point about bonus and commission is that if because bonus and commission is allowed, dividend paid is not allowed because dividend is not actually an expense. It is an appropriation. Right. You understand that dividend, paying dividend is not an external expense. It is an appropriation of profits. So if you are paying bonus, but actually it is not bonus, actually it is dividend, but you are giving it a name of bonus. So if there is any bonus which is paid in lieu of dividend, then it is not allowed. Then it is not allowed because the amount which you are paying, you are just on the face of it, you have named it as bonus, but it is not actually bonus. If it is dividend, then we will not be allowing it because dividend is not an allowable expense, right? So this is important that bonus and commission or that bonus should not be in lieu of dividend, should not be in the nature of dividend. Third and a very important point in section 36. Third point says that if you have taken a loan, because generally business takes loan, right? So if you are taking a loan, you have to pay interest also. So if there is any interest expense, if there is any interest expense, that interest expense is also allowed under section 36. So you have taken a lo loan, whether it is a short term loan, it's a long term loan, doesn't matter, it's a bank loan, doesn't matter. If you have taken a loan and there is any interest on that, then that interest is also allowed. Few important point about this interest. First of all, if you have taken this loan from any bank, financial institutions or notified NBFCs, NBFCs, non-banking financial companies. Again, I'm repeating, if you have taken this loan from bank, financial institutions or NBFCs, then it is covered under section 43B. See, 43B is covering now. So, so when, uh, I've said that, I've already mentioned that there are some six or seven points in 43B. So first we have done any type of taxes. Second point in 43B is bonus and commission. Now it is the third point, which is now getting added in that list. Third point is, that if you have taken a loan from any bank, financial institutions or notified NBFCs, then it will only be allowed, such interest will only be allowed if it is actually paid due, during the previous year or up to the due date of ROI. If you can, if you have paid it up to the due date of ROI, then it is allowed. But if you have not paid it up to the due date of ROI, not allowed. If you are paying after the due date, it will be allowed, but not, not in this year, then it will be allowed in that year when it is actually paid, right? So bonus and commission, uh, sorry, a bonus and commission is covered. Interest on borrowing is also have covered. First point you have to remember that it is subject to 43B if you have taken this loan from bank, financial institution or NBFCs. But if you have taken a loan from someone else, then 43B will not be uh, levied over here, right? 43B, please don't involve 43B in that case. 43B will only come into picture if you have taken a loan from bank, financial institution or NBFCs. Got it? Next point is that if you have taken a loan, let's say you have taken a loan for purchase any asset, to purchase any asset, but that asset is not yet put to use. That asset is not yet put to use, but you have taken the loan. So obviously you have to pay interest also. This section, section 36 is saying that till the date, that till the period for which the you have paid the interest, but the asset is not put to use, 
up to that particular period up to the date when it is put to use up to that particular period you have to take this expense not as a revenue expense but a capital expense it should be capitalized in the value of that particular asset right did, did you remember that so if there is any interest amount which is related to the period up to the date of put to use it is not allowed under section 36 it will not be allowed under section 36 so period up to which the asset is put to use should be capitalized capitalized means it will be added in the value of the asset it will not be allowed only once the asset is put to use once the asset is put to use any interest which is after that particular date then you can allow that interest as a revenue expense but up to the date of put to use please capitalize that interest right same concept goes for zero coupon bonds zero coupon bonds you understand that there are some companies especially some infrastructure companies they issues zero coupon bonds zero coupon coupon over here means interest we issue zero interest bond that is on these bonds we don't pay interest but yes interest is paid indirectly how because you understand let's say if there is a bond with face value of with face value of let's say rupees 100 and we are issuing it at discount we are issuing this bond at discounted price let's say we are issuing this price at uh, this uh, at discount for rupees let's say 20 rupees so we ask the investor we tell them that boss the face value of this bond is 100 the face value of this bond is 100 but we are giving it to you at a very concessional amount at a very discounted price how much you can take it for 20 okay if we will take it for 20 what will happen we will say that we are giving you this bond and the life of the bond is let's say the life is for example 10 years so please give us 20 rupees right now for next 10 years we are not going to pay you any interest we are not going to pay you any interest but after 10 years we will pay you 100 rupees we will pay you the face value of this bond so this is the concept of zero coupon bonds i believe that you are able to recall this okay so tell me we are not paying any interest it is we can prima facie it is looking that we are not paying any interest but tell me whether the company who has issued such bonds are they paying interest the answer is yes technically if we will look at it closely then they are paying interest also because they are paying 80 rupees on redemption and they have already taken only 20 rupees as the issue price so they are paying 80 rupees extra 80 rupees extra which is getting paid it is nothing but a kind of interest we say it is a zero interest bond but actually it is not so please tell me the company who has issued such bonds the assessee who has issued such bonds they are paying 80 rupees extra right and this 80 rupees will be spread over the life of such bond so if the life of the bond is 10 years so every year we will say there is an expense of 8 rupees, 8 rupees, 8 rupees and so on. So we have what we will do is the difference between this redemption price and issue price. So the difference was 80 rupees. So 80 rupees, whatever the difference is, that is you can easily make your own formula. Face value was 100, that is the redemption price minus issue price. So this is the difference. This is the total interest which the company is incurring. Please spread this over the life of this bond. So if the life of the bond is let's say 10 years, so every year there is an expense of 80 rupees, this sorry 8 rupees. So this 8 rupees can be claimed as a deduction under section 36. I believe you have recalled this provision also. Okay, then again very important employer contribution to provident fund. You understand that let's say if there is any company, let's say for example, there is a company TCS, Tata Consultancy Services, they are paying to their employees, they are paying to their employee, let's say salary of rupees 50,000 per month. So 50,000 is an expense for TCS, you understand? It is 50,000 rupees the salary expense. In, his, in their PL account, TCS, this is TCS PL account. So, in their PL account, they can show that they are paying salary to their employee. How much? 50,000 rupees per month into 12, they are paying 6 lakh. 
First of all, tell me, is it a business expense for TCS? The answer is yes, because they are paying salary to the employee. This is also a business expense. Is it allowed under section 36? No, salary is not mentioned in 36. We will see that salary is allowed under section 37. We will see it today that salary is allowed under section 37. Salary, paying salary is allowed under section 37. Okay, tell me if the, this TCS, this company is paying bonus also. So if they are paying bonus also, let's say of rupees 1 lakh, is it allowed? The answer is yes, it is allowed under section 36. But yes, if it is mentioned that it is not yet paid up to the due date of ROI, then we will not allow it because section 43B will disallow such bonus because we understand bonus is generally allowed under section 36, but there is also a section 43B that should also come into picture if bonus or commission is getting paid, right? So if it is actually paid up to the due date of ROI, we will allow it. But if it is not paid, we will not allow it. But yes, I was saying that salary is not covered under 36. We will see in 37, it is allowed. Bonus is covered under section 36. I was saying that if TCS has opened a provident fund for the employees, they are, have opened a provident fund for the employees. You understand what is provident fund? We have already come uh, dealt with the, this in the chapter of salary. So if TCS is depositing some amount in their provident fund, it is provident fund or it is superannuation fund or any approved fund, any other retirement funds. If this fund, please remember, if this fund, whether it is provident fund, superannuation fund or any other retirement benefit, benefit fund, if this fund is approved, this fund should be an approved fund. That is, it should be either recognized or it should be statutory. It should not be unrecognized. No. Section 36 says, if the employer also deposit the amount where in recognized provident fund or statutory provident fund, it should be recognized. Unrecognized? No. It should be recognized, right? Or statutory uh, superannuation fund or approved superannuation fund or any other retirement benefit fund, but it should be approved. It should be recognized or in either it should be statutory, right? It should not be unrecognized. So if it is approved fund and TCS is depositing the amount in this fund, so again TCS is incurring some extra expense. So what we will write TCS in their PL account will say that we are depositing this amount to their recognized provident fund. So we call it, you understand, we call this employer's contribution to recognized provident fund or superannuation provident fund or any other recognized retirement benefit fund. So this expense, because this is an extra expense which the company is incurring, this expense is also allowed under section 36. This expense is also allowed under section 36. But again, 43B will come into picture here as well. Here also 43B will come into picture. Section 43B, I was already mentioning that there are some six or seven expenses which are there in 43B. And this is also one of them. So tell me, till now, in section 43B, although we have not discussed section 43B so far, I'll be discussing it individually also later on when I'll reach that particular section. What is section 43B all about? 43B says that there are certain expenses. This section is very important. That, that is the reason I am explaining this in detail. There are certain expenses which will be allowed only on payment basis. If they are actually paid, then only we can allow such expenses. Then only we can allow such expenses. And they have also given, 43B has also given us a date. Either you have paid it during the previous year, it's okay. And even if you have paid it up to the due date of ROI, up to the due date of ROI, we are okay with it. If you have paid it up to the due date of ROI, then also we are okay with it. And I tell you, there is an important amendment also in section 43B. That is the reason 43B will become more important, especially for your 2024 examination. This will become more important. There is an important amendment also. One more expense is added to that list related to MSME, micro, small or medium enterprises. It is added. So I'll explain what the amendment is when once I'll be explaining 43B. But yes, you now have a rough idea of what is 43B. 43B 
contain some list of expenses so one of the expenses was any type of taxes any type of taxes payable to government that is the reason i have discussed this point in section 30 because there you were paying municipal taxes there you were paying municipal taxes so municipal taxes is also any type of tax which is payable to government government here could be your central government it could be state government it could be local authority also so we pay uh, we pay municipal taxes to local authority that is duly covered under section 43b so taxes of building is allowed under section 30 subject to 43b what does subject to 43b means that 43b condition should also be fulfilled right i'm again repeating what what do, uh, do i mean when i'm saying subject to 43b i mean that the conditions of 43b should also be fulfilled that is it should be paid up to the due date of roi what other what expenses are covered under 43b we have discussed bonus or com commission also it is also subject to 43b third we have discussed if any interest is payable to any bank financial institutions and notified NBFCs, then also it is subject to 43B. And right now I'm discussing employer contribution, employer contribution to these recognized prudent fund or super innovation fund or retirement benefit funds provided they are approved, right? There are certain more expenses also, but so far we have discussed four out of them. Majorly 43B is already covered, although I'll be covering 43B specifically separately also. Okay, so what I was discussing in section 36, section 36 they says if, if employer, you are an SSE, you are contributing to recognized, it should, if it is unrecognized, please don't allow it. If it is unrecognized, please don't allow it only to recognize provident fund or statutory or approved, I can say, right? It is allowed, but please make sure that this amount is actually deposited in the fund. Please make sure TCS, please make sure you are sure that this amount should be deposited in this fund up to the due date of ROI because this amount is allowed under section 36 subject to 43B. Are you all able to understand this? Subject to 43B means 43B condition is also applicable on this, um, on this expense and that is the reason it should be paid. Paid here means it should be deposited in that fund up to the due date of ROI. Got it? And similarly, we have one more section where we have one more expense in section 36, employer contribution to pension scheme. Employer contribution to pension scheme is also allowed under section 36. So, so if the employer is contributing for employee, where they are depositing the amount in pension scheme. So it is also allowed. One important point here, which you should remember regarding pension scheme that if employer is contributing, let's say TCS, Tata Consultancy Services is contributing to employee pension scheme, right? It should not be more than 10% of salary. It should not be more than 10% of salary. Here salary means basic salary plus DA forming part. This can come in your MCQ. This can, um, question can uh, be created over here on uh, so your MCQ, they can ask you, in the MCQ part also and in other cases also they can ask you but MCQ question can come related to the pension scheme. So if TCS is contributing for employee in their pension scheme that is called employer contribution to pension scheme is also allowed under section 36 but there is the internal limit of 10% of salary and salary here means basic salary and DA forming part of retirement benefits. Right this point is clear please do remember this point also. Okay. So fifth point we have already discussed employer contribution to approved or recognized provident fund, super innovation fund, gratuity fund. But yes, this fund should be approved or I can say that this fund should be recognized. And yes, it is subject to this point is also subject to section 43B that if employer is contributing, please contribute, please deposit this money in that fund up to the due date of ROI. Are you all getting this? Okay. Sixth point also, I have already discussed this with you. Employer contribution to pension scheme. Employer contribution to pension scheme, it is also allowed. And we will see more about pension scheme in section 80 CCD. 80 CCD is there in the chapter of deduction. We will see more about this pension scheme there. But please do remember here that pension scheme, if the employer is contributing to pension scheme, it is also allowed. But 
most important thing is this one. If it is up to 10% of salary, then it is allowed. But if it is more than 10% of salary, then such excess amount, then such excess amount will not be allowed. Up to 10% of salary is allowed. We will not say that we will disallow the entire amount. No. Up to 10%, okay. In excess of 10%, we will not going to allow. Correct. And here the salary includes your basic salary plus DA forming part. Here the definition of salary is basic salary plus DA forming part. Are you all able to get this? Easy? Okay. Not really easy, but still, so uh, it's easy, but there is, it's so voluminous there. There are so minor points over here that you should remember. And that can be remembered through practice only. The more you practice, the more uh, you revise it. Keep, please uh, make your revisions multiple times. Please, you have to do your revisions multiple times. That is the way how you will be able to manage your studies. So first of all, in first reading, for, in first reading for every subject, whenever you are doing a subject for the first time, it should be done in detailed manner. It should be done in a very detailed manner. Your concept should get strong in the first place itself. But after that, please multiply your revisions. Multiply your revisions. Keep on adding your revisions. Two times, three times, four times. If you are through your revisions four times, then I'll, I'll tell you 100% you will be able to clear the examination. And that too with very good marks. So this is the mantra to pass the examination. Please, 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 please give time to your revision. Let's say you are completing two or three sub uh, chapters, then talk before uh, switching on to the fourth chapter. Please stop. If, if you have to give the entire day also, that is fine. Stop and revise whatever you have done in the last three chapters, right? Instead of going to fourth chapter, fifth chapter, sixth chapter, please do one or two chapters. Stop yourself. Do the revision first. Make it strong and then go to other four, five, six chapter. Stop, then revise four, five, six, and then on next day revise all these six chapters. The number of times you will uh, revise it more, it will make you. It, this will become very easy to pass the examination. I'm telling you, it will. This is the only mantra that how you manage your studies, how you manage your studies, and it is not at all difficult. The only thing is that you have to give your sufficient time. You have to give your enough time. And it's a consistent process. I understand sometimes it becomes very hectic. Sometimes it becomes very monotonous. Sometimes uh, we also feel depressed sometimes that nothing is happening. It is, I am telling you that it is the something which is very natural, which is very normal. It happens with every human being. The person who obtained first rank also AR1, this thing happens with them, with them also. It happens with everyone. Not only with students, with teachers also, but with professional also. It's a part and parcel of life. Everything, uh, this will happen. If you are doing any of the activity, if you are doing any work, it will happen. That sometimes you will feel that you feel very dejected. But please, that should be very temporary. Next day, feel motivated that you have to do it. And the only, the I am giving you a trick that just be consistent. Don't look at it. If it is not going in through, uh, through your way, it's okay. It's completely fine. Please uh, don't get stuck to it, right? You have to just keep on moving, keep moving, be consistent, keep on. And here for students, I, I will say, please uh, also consider your revisions as important as completing your syllabus. In, in fact, I would say that uh, revising your things which you have already completed, that is more important than completing the entire course. Right? Okay, let's come back. So I was saying, employer contribution to pension scheme, if it is up to 10%, it's okay. In excess of 10%, you can disallow that. Employee contribution. You understand, as I was discussing here, that TCS has opened a PF account or SAF or retirement benefit fund account and employer contributes to the such funds. And you also know in the chapter of salary, we have already discussed that employee also contributes their, their own con con contribution to this account, right? To, so to this fund, employer will also contribute, employee will also contribute, employee also deposit this amount. But tell me how employee deposit this amount? Actually, employee doesn't de deposit their amount directly over here. What we do is, 
TCS while paying salary to the employee, while paying salary to the employee, we deduct certain amount and we deduct this amount and then we will deposit this amount in this fund and that is called employee's contribution. Why? Because we have deducted that part, that amount from their salary and we are depositing it. So this becomes TCS responsibility or any of the employer's responsibility. It becomes the employer's responsibility that whatever amount they have deducted from employee salary, it should be duly deposited in this fund. You should not keep this amount which you have deducted with yourself. If you will keep it with yourself, it will become your income. It will become your income because it is not your money. It is employee's hard earned money that you should deposit it over here. So what is the time limit of depositing it over here? Is it up to the due date of ROI? No, it is up to the due date of that respective act. Here it is very important. So if it is employee's contribution, if it is employee's contribution, then you should deposit this amount up to the due date of that respective act. Let's say if it is PF act, then you should deposit it as per the PF act. And what is the due date as per the PF act? It is next month 15th. We will give you 15 days. So if it is, let's say, if it is March provident fund, then it should be deposited within 15 days. That is 15th of April. If it is January provident fund, it should be deposited within 15 days. That is 15th of February. So we will give you 15 days, right? So if there is any employee contribution and you have kept it with yourself and you have not deposited up to the due date of that respective event, not up to the due date of ROI. Employer contribution, employer contribution was should be can be deposited up to the due date of ROI. But employee contribution, because there is there it's employees' money. Please deposit it up to the due date of that respective act. That is within 15 days you should deposit it. And if you will not deposit it, or if you will deposit late, we will make it your income. TCS, we will make it your income. Even if, if you will deposit it on 16th, let's say because we have given you 15 days and if you have not deposited in 15 days and you deposit it on the next day that is on 16th day it will not uh, make any difference we will make that your income so even if you will deposit late but we will make that income to you for you so here it is mentioned that employee contribution must be deposited when it should be deposited up to the due date of the respective act that is if I, you say uh, about PF, it is 15th of the next month. Okay. So what we are doing, we are doing section 36. Section 36 is related to other deductions. So uh, let us revise the things which we have already completed. First was insurance premium of building and of plant and machinery. Of building it is section 30. For plant and machinery furniture it is 31. But other than that, mainly for stock sector, it is section 36. But yes, health insurance is also allowed under section 36 for the employees of the family members. It should not be paid in cash. Bonus and commission it should allowed subject to 43B. I'm so sorry. Okay. Interest on borrowing. If you have taken a loan, it's a short term or long term loan. Even if the companies have taken a loan in the form of debenture because debenture is also in the nature of loan. So if you are paying debenture interest, that is also allowed under section 36. But yes, if any loan is taken for purchasing any asset and that asset is not put to use up to the date or uh, the period till the asset is put to use, you have to capitalize that interest. And after, once the asset is put to use of the interest related to that period, which is after the date to put to use, then you can claim as a deduction in the section 36. And if you have taken interest from bank, financial institution or NBFCs, then it is allowed subject to section 43B. Discount on zero coupon bonds I have already mentioned. You have to spread that particular difference because you have issued at a lesser price. You will redeem at a face value. So whatever the difference is the interest, please spread that interest on the life of the bond. Employer contribution is allowed subject to 43B. Is it if they have contributed in an un, unapproved fund? Is it allowed unapproved or non-recognized? No, it should be approved or it should be recognized or it should be statutory, right? Pension scheme, you understand it is allowed, but if it is in excess of 10% of salary, up to 10% allowed, excess amount will not be allowed. Employee contribution, employee contribution, whenever you deduct that, it will become your income. And if you deposit it up to 15th day of next month, it's okay. You will not make it income. 
But if you will not deposit this amount or you deposit it late after, let's say, 15 days, you are depositing around 16 days, 17 day, then it will become your income. Correct. Initially, pre previously, there are some days of grace were also available five days, but now there is no days of grace over here. It is only 15 days. Eighth point is that if you have purchased any livestock, livestock means if you are using any uh, cattle, horses, camels in your animals, if you are using animals or livestock in your business, so you can claim deduction at the time when these animals becomes useless or they dies. At that time, you can claim deduction because generally, if let's say we have a business, let's say we have some spices business and we have a business in Rajasthan, let's say. So for transportation, we have purchased the camel. So let's say we have purchased the camel and the cost of this camel was, I don't know how much camel costs. Let's say it is 2 lakh rupees and we have purchased this camel. So what entry you will pass, what accounting entry you will pass, you will pass an accounting entry that livestock debit or you can say camel debit livestock account debit 2 lakh to bank 2 lakh right and this livestock will sit as your asset in your balance sheet correct so will you be claiming any deduction is this amount this livestock debit will sit in your balance sheet asset side and bank again one of your asset is decreased another asset is increased it will not hit your PL. There is no expense booked. Whenever you have purchased this particular livestock in the year of purchase, there will be no amount which will be hit in your PL account. Can you claim depreciation on this? So on generally on assets, we can claim depreciation, but not on livestock. You cannot claim depreciation on livestock, right? So in the year when you have purchased it, there will be no impact on your PL account. You cannot claim any deduction. Correct. So there is no deduction available. So let's say you are using it, this camel for first year, you have used it for second year, you have used it third year, you have used it fourth year, you have used it. There will be no deduction. Simply two lakh you have spent the amount. It will sit in your balance sheet. But unfortunately, in fifth year, this camel dies. This camel dies. In that case, here is the loss of livestock here in this year you can claim it as a deduction. So whatever the loss which you have incurred, you can claim this deduction. So you can claim rupees 2 lakh deduction over here. You can like you will be writing it off from your account because now it is uh, uh, now it, this camel has died. So what entry you can pass, you can pass PL account debit to livestock. Now you are writing this livestock account from your account. You are writing it off. So this would be 2 lakh, 2 lakh, 2 lakh would be your loss. And this loss is allowed under section 36. This loss is allowed under section 36. But yes, it might be, it might happen that you are selling the body of this camel, the dead body, you are selling it, let's say. So someone approaches you and he's saying, uh, that person says that, okay, you can give me this body because the, uh, the camel is dead now. Please give his body to me and I'll pay you 10,000 rupees. So let's say you have recovered 10,000 rupees for the body. So how much is the net amount of loss which you have incurred? 1.9 lakh. So what entry you will pass? You don't have to pass any entry in your tax edition, but still, why I'm uh, passing a general entry over here just to make you understand, right? You don't have to pass any general entry in your tax paper. But yes, so, so let's say if you are recovering 10,000 rupees by selling the car cases, car cases means de the dead body. So in that case, you will pass bank account debit. You have received 10,000 rupees and your livestock you will write it off and how much is the livestock sitting in your books of accounts two lakh rupees you will write it off entirely so we will pass two livestock two lakh and how much is the net pnl account the loss is 1.9 lakh so this is the 1.9 lakh so you don't have to pass any uh, you don't have to pass any accounting entry but still 1.9 lakh you can understand that this is the loss which you can book in this year so if i'll um explain you by making a statement, I'll simply say that whatever was the cost of the livestock, deduct any amount which is recovered, deduct any amount which is recovered. So this is the net loss on such death. You can claim this loss and this is allowed under section 36. And even it is not actually required that uh, the animal should die. 
if it, they become permanently useless let's say if something happens to this animal it becomes useless it's not we will not be able to use this animal for transportation let's say he's now ill permanently becomes ill or something happens to his legs or anything which happens some accident he uh, some accident took place so in that case also you can claim a loss correct so this is allowed under section 36 so it says loss of animal or or uh, livestock whatever is the cost of the animal deduct any amount recovered so this is the net loss which you can claim under section 36 ninth very important and easy bed debt so if there is any bed debt if it is if you are making just a provision for doubtful debt provision for doubtful debt is not allowed so if in your examination if in your penal account you see that in your debit side the assessee has made a provision for doubtful debts if the assessee has made a provision of a doubtful debt let's say of rupees 2 lakh please don't allow such provision such provision is not allowed only actual bed debts is allowed actual bed debt what does actual bed debt means actual bed debt means you should write off your debtors if your debtors have actually been written off then you can claim a deduction right so actual bed debts deduction can be claimed under section 36 provision for doubtful debts is not allowed right so bed debts you can claim and we will also see in section 41 that if you have recovered any if you have claimed a deduction of bed debt under section 36 and later on if you recover such bed debt so it will become your income under section 41 deemed business income because we understand because we have in some earlier year we have taken a deduction because we were thinking that it has become bad but fortunately after two three four five years they come back and says that sorry sir we have uh, not uh, given you the money now we would like to give you the money and they are now giving us the money so whatever the uh, amount which we have recovered that will become our income provided we have taken a deduction also earlier right so bed debt is easy provision for bed debts is it allowed or not allowed not allowed provision for bed debts will not be allowed okay next is expenditure on family planning so if the assessee has incurred any expenditure on family planning so what type of expense is it family planning expenditure why the uh, why the assessee incurs family planning expenses actually practically right now it's not that relevant but it was relevant somewhere in the year uh, in 1970s it was relevant because at that time when indira gandhi mrs indira gandhi uh, was the prime minister of india at that time also there was a population explosion there was a population explosion and she was very keen on reducing the pop the population so at that time she come up come out with a with an idea that she asked the companies she asked the companies she has uh, framed various schemes and one of the scheme is that where uh, the government was asking the companies they were asking the companies that you have so many employees who are working uh, for your company so please educate those employees please educate that those employees or also get a medical treatment done of the, your employees so that the population can be restricted we can uh, just make uh, this uh, population under control so they approached companies right so this so what this com what com company does is they formed a, a, they have spent it something on family planning expenses let's say they have a, if they have a huge company let's say they have a huge build, building of their company they have uh, made some one or two rooms and they have converted those rooms into a small clinic type or you can say a small nursing home or a hospital they have converted they have built up one or two rooms they have converted those rooms into a clinic you can say nursing home you can say hospital and they have also appointed some dog doctors so what they were doing it they were medically treating those um, employees they were getting their um, treatment done right you understand that how this function performs so uh, they were incurring expenses they were incurring expenses because why because the government has asked to, to do them so these expenses which is incurred on family planning these are allowed under section 36 but important point is that this expense is only allowed to company SSE it is not allowed to individual it is not allowed to HUF it is not allowed to partnership firm or any other SSE this expenses on uh, family planning is only and only for company SSE if in your examination if you see that the assessee is an individual and in their PL account that person is individual let's say Mr X and in their PL account they have debited 
that this is family uh, planning expenses, whether revenue or capital, please don't allow it because this is allowed only to company SSC, right? You will be able to remember family planning expenses are only allowed to company SSC, not for any other SSC, not even partnership firm, not even AOP, BY, no. It is only and only for company SSC. And as I have already mentioned that these companies have incurred, uh, they have built a building, they have uh, built some rooms, they are now converting them into hospital or nursing home or uh, clinic, whatever you can call them. So they are incurring revenue expenses also and they are incurring capital expenses also. Correct. So these companies, let's say it is X limited. So they were incurring revenue expenses as well as capital expenses. So if it is revenue expense on, on family planning or capital expenses on family planning, both are allowed under section 36. Both are allowed under section 36. But related to the expenses related to cap, capital expenditure, so let's say if it is 5 lakh, it is allowed in 5 equal installment. For revenue expenses, we can allow it entirely 100%. But capital expenses are although allowed, but they are allowed in 5 equal installments. So whatever the capital expenses they have incurred, please divide it by 5. Only one fifth will be allowed in this year and remaining 4 fifths will be allowed in next 4 years. That is total 5 years. You will be able to remember this. Okay. And another thing, which is now easy now, because you know how you will treat your unabsorbed depreciation. You understand how you will treat your unabsorbed depreciation? Yes, sir, we already have completed this. We know that if there are profits which are sufficient, then our depreciation can get absorbed. But if there is no sufficient profit, then this depreciation remains unabsorbed. It can be set off from any other head except salary. Or if it could not be set off, it can be carried forward to next years. And for unlimited years of years, we can carry it forward. Same treatment goes for unabsorbed capital expenses for scientific research also. Same treatment we have discussed while discussing section 35. I have told you the same treatment which unabsorbed appreciation has, same treatment we will give to unabsorbed capital expenses on scientific research. Same treatment will go to this one also. We understand that one fifth will allow, but provided we have sufficient profits. So same treatment will go to unabsorbed. unabsorbed capital expenditure on family planning. Same treatment will be given to this also. So they all three were treated in the same manner. So we will allow one fifth of, cap of capital expenditure provided they are sufficient profits. If there are no sufficient profits, it will remain unabsorbed. If it, is, it will remain unabsorbed, such an unab, uh, unabsorbed portion can be set off from any other head except salary. If it could not be set off in this year, then we will carry it forward. And in next year also, we can set it off from any head other than salary and it can carry forward for unlimited years till the amount, till the time it will be set off, right? But revenue expenses, we will allow it fully, whether they are profits available or not available. Because of revenue exp uh, expenses, business loss can arise. But because of capital expenditure, business loss cannot arise because they will allowed, they will be only allowed up to the extent of profits available, right? If they are revenue expenses, whether they are getting absorbed or not, because there is no such thing like unabsorbed cap revenue expenses on family planning. No, revenue expenses will be allowed fully, whether there are profit available or if there are no sufficient profit, then it will result into losses that we call business losses. Understand? You are able to recall this point also. So, family planning expenses are allowed, but only to company SSE and uh, all revenue expenses are allowed. Capital expenses are allowed, but only to one fifth and unabsorbed capital expenditure on family planning will be treated in the same manner as unabsorbed depreciation. Next is securities transaction tax and commodities transaction tax. So what is this STT or what is this CTT? You understand, uh, let me explain with the first STT. STT is a tax which is charged by the stock exchange. Why? Because uh, whenever you purchase or sell uh, shares on stock exchange, so there is a tax, uh, there is a small tax which is levied by stock exchanges. This is called STT. So this is the exp expense which you, if you are uh, into this particular transactions, if you are purchasing or selling shares, then you have to pay STT also. If it is your business expense, because we are doing PGVP, right? If you, we are doing PGVP, if STT or CTT, commodities transaction tax is your business expense, then you can allow it. So when it will become business, let's say we are a stockbroker. So we are into business of selling of 
सिक्योरिटीज राइट और वी आर अ कमोडिटी ब्रोकर सो वी आर इन टू बिजनेस ऑफ सेलिंग कमोडिटीज सो इफ वी आर इन टू बिजनेस इन सच बिजनेस देन दिस इज इफ दिस इज अ बिजनेस एक्सपेंस देन इट इज अलाउड राइट बिकॉज इफ अ पर्सन इज अ इन्वेस्टर लेट से यू परचेज शेयर एंड यू सेल शेयर ऑल्सो बट नॉट रेगुलरली दिस इज नॉट योर बिजनेस राइट दिस इज नॉट योर बिजनेस यू जस्ट डू दिस एज अ पर्पज ऑफ इन्वेस्टमेंट सो इन दैट केस If you are selling your shares, it will become your PGBP income, or it will become your capital gain income. In that case, it will become your capital gain income, right? Selling shares because that was held as an investment. You are selling it, your shares. So that will become your capital gain income, and STT will be charged there also. But STT will, in that case, it will not be your business expense. Rather, it will be in your capital gain. But in capital gain, we see that these types of expenses are not allowed. STT is not an allow an allowable expense if it is related to your capital gain income. But yes, if STT and CTT is related to your PGBP income, then it is allowed. So I can say for brokers it is allowed, right? And even for those who who does intraday trading, intraday trading means that the same day they, they purchase shares or the same day they sell the shares. In that case also, because that is known as a speculative business, right? In that case also, STT can be allowed. But if it is for intraday, but if it is not intraday. If you are purchasing the shares today and you are selling it tomorrow, it will not be intraday. It is a kind of a long-term investment. It will go in capital gain. In that case, STT is not allowed. So we will see. I'll also tell you that STT, if it is related to capital gain, it will not be allowed. But if STT or CTT is related to your PGBP, then only it can be allowed under Section 36. So these are the expenses which are allowed under Section 36. Section 36 is dealing with other deduction. Similarly, we have another section, one of the uh, the last section in this particular part, the deductions which are allowed under PGBP. So we have section thirty seven. Thirty seven is related to is a general deduction. Is a general deduction. It will not tell you because in section thirty, see if we look at all the sections which we have done, section thirty was related to expenses related to building, specifically building. Second thirty one. Planning machinery or furniture. What type of expense? Repairs and insurance. We were specific. In section thirty-two, we were specific. Depreciation. Section thirty-five, we were specific. It was scientific research expense. Section thirty-six also. We have I have given you specifically some list of expenses. But while uh, explaining you section thirty-seven, I tell you that there is no list in section thirty-seven. There is no such list. Section thirty-seven is not specific. It is the name of section thirty-seven is. general deduction it tells us it will not give you a list of any expense but it will give you some conditions it will give you some conditions that if these conditions are satisfied then your expense can be allowed in 37 but if this condition is not satisfied then it will not be allowed right i tell you practically more than 90% of the expenses are covered under section 37 because From section thirty to thirty six, we have just done some of the expenses, right? There are so many expenses like purchases, paying salary, freight inward, freight outward. There are so many expenses. All these expenses are allowed under section thirty seven. So, what are the conditions in uh, section thirty seven? First condition is that because thirty seven is a general section, it is not specific. It is general. So, first condition is in the same manner. It says that if any of the expense is covered under section 30 to 36 if any of the expenses covered under section 30 to 36 then please allow in that section only please don't come in 37 because we if there is any specific section which is uh, there for that particular expense so please allow in that section if that expense is not covered under section 30 to 36 then you can bring that expense in 37 right so first condition is that such expense if you would like to allow in 37 it should not be covered in 30 to 36 easy second condition is that it should be a revenue expense 37 will say if it is a capital expense we will not going to allow it it should be a revenue expense third condition it says that it should be of business nature if it is a personal expense we will not going to allow it it should be a business nature and the last condition is fourth condition is that this expense should be a legal expense it should not be illegal it should not be like that you have made any contravention of law and you are paying penalty no it should not be prohibited by law it should not be illegal it should be a legal expense so if any expense satisfies all these four conditions it can come under section 37 it can come under section 37 so if you will see the conditions are such expenditure should not be allowed under 30 to 36 such expense 
must be of business and profession, not personal. It should be revenue in nature. It should not be capital expenditure and it should not be illegal or prohibited by any law. So if all these four conditions are satisfied on any of the expense, it will be allowed under section 37. So I have given you some examples. This is, this is not given under section 37. I have given you some examples. Section 37 only mentions these conditions, right? So what are the expenses? See purchases. Purchases was not covered under 32, 36 anywhere. So, and it is for business purpose, it is of revenue nature and it's not illegal to purchase uh, your stock. It is not illegal. So, purchases can be allowed, salary payment can be allowed, advertisement can be allowed. But if it is an advertisement like of capital nature, it will not be allowed. It should be a revenue expenses. Freight and word, GST custom duty is allowed. GST or custom duty because it is not covered if you are paying GST or you are paying custom duty in direct taxes. If you are paying, then it is for business nature. It is revenue, day to day expenses. It is not covered under 30 to 36 and it is purely legal. So these are also allowed under section 37. But yes, because this is a kind of tax, section 43B will be attracted over here because 43B says any type of tax is allowed. But if it is actually paid up to the due date of ROI, so if you are paying GST customs, it will be allowed for it. Telephone expenses, printing and station expenses, festival expenses, festival expenses. Yes, in your uh, in your organization, you can arrange team meetings, you can arrange events, you can arrange uh, get togethers, you can do some staff welfare activities. So there would be expenses. They are obviously related to business, right? Key man insurance policy, if you have taken for your uh, worker who is a very uh, particular, uh, very significant for your organization. So you can pay key man insurance for premium also. That is a expense which is allowed under section 37. Bonus issue expenses. So bonus issue, is it a capital expenses because it is related to capital of the company? So the court has said here, so there were some hue and cry in the industry, sir, whether bonus issue expenses can be allowed or not. So some of the court cases and some of the court cases, it is decided that yes, these bonus expenses can be allowed. Why? Because when you issue bonus, your capital base doesn't get increased, right? Because how do you issue bonus? You must have done in your accounting also that issue of bonus. How do, how do we issue bonus? We don't take money from outside. We just capitalize our reserve. So whatever the free reserves which are available to us that we capitalize into a uh, shares, right? So there is no increase in capital base. That is the reason bonus issue expenses are allowed. They are treated as revenue expenses and they are allowed. But if you are issuing new shares, if you are coming up with IPO, if you are coming up with FPO or even right shares, if you are issuing it, then your capital base gets increased. In that case, those expenses are capital in nature that will not be allowed. So if it is the right shares issue expenses, not allowed uh, or new any new share or uh, FPO you are coming up with, it will not be allowed. But if it is bonus issue expenses, then only it will be allowed. Correct? So these are allowed. Important point is CSR expenses are not allowed. Corporate social responsibilities because we understand because in company law it is mentioned that if the uh, company is a big company, they have their turnover or their net worth uh, up to a specific, if it is more than the specific limit, then they have to incur some expenses related to corporate social responsibility. For the society, they have to do something. They have to spend something for the society that we call CSR expenses. So here it uh, there is a fight between company law and income tax because company law will say please you have to incur the expenses but these expenses are not allowed under income tax this is very important these csr expenses are not allowed under income tax under section 37 why because 30 one of the condition is 37 is, is that that it should be related to your business these csr expenses are not related to our business that is the reason it is not allowed see if there is a company let's say there is a company in bangalore they have um, incurred some corporate social responsibility expenses. Let's say there is a, a village in Odisha and they have incurred any expenses related to, uh, they have opened a school in Odisha. That is a CSR activity. So it was not related to the business, right? So they have a company based in Bangalore. Let's say it's an IT company. So there is no link at that expenses which we have incurred in opening a school or making a road somewhere, let's say in Odisha, in Tamil Nadu, wherever it is. So if we have incurred some expenses over there, then in that case, it will not be related to business, then it will not be allowed. So company law says that you should do that expense, but income tax will say we are not going to allow it because it is not related to business. Correct. Important thing is that next important thing is that that these pharmaceutical companies, their pharmaceutical companies are what they were doing is that they are giving incentives to doctors. 
to these medical practitioners they were giving incentives so that they can recommend their medicines to their patients so they were giving incentives to them they are giving some gifts to them even the gifts are of such a nature that they used to give organize a trip let's say three days trip uh, for abroad three days trip to singapore seven days trip to europe and so on they used to give gifts to the uh, doctors or medical practitioners so that they can recommend their medicines to the patients but medical association find this unethical medical association of india finds this unethical they say that this is a very unethical practice so here cbdt comes out with a circular that if these pharmaceutical companies are giving gifts of free these to these doctors it is they they says that this is our ad advertisement expenses but i am as mentioned uh, all india medical association has mentioned that this is something which is unethical so cbdt has come up with a circular that if this pharmaceutical companies will give gifts or such type of perquisites to these doctors it will not be regarded as an expense we will not be allowing this expense so these expenses are not allowed another important point is section 37 2b it says that if you contribute in any political party brochure catalog pamphlet and you say that you are advertise you are making an advertisement in political party section 37 2b has specifically mentioned that if you contribute to the political party we are not going to allow it we are not going to allow it as a business expense but yes while uh, when we will do a chapter of deduction there are few sections atggb atggc it says that if you have contributed to for what political party then it is allowed there as deduction but not here in pgbp you will simply disallow it right so this was section 37 one of a very small section 38 says proportionate deduction it's a very easy section and very logical also it says section 38 says that if you have incurred any expense which we have discussed from section 30 to 37 take any of the expense if that expense is not fully related to business let's say you have incurred rent of building let's say rent of building i have taken an example rent of building so if you have using in that building let's say 50% building is used for personal purpose 50% is used for business purpose so section 38 will say that only the expense which is related to a business purpose that will only be allowed if it is related to a personal purpose it will not be allowed so you have 38 is simply simply an expense it says that all the expenses which we have discussed from section 30 to 37 so it are allowed but if it is related for business also and for other purpose also then we will be allowing them only the proportionate expenses will only be allowed so this was section 38 now uh, we are done with this portion also so we are done with these portion section 30 to 37 deductions allowed under pgvp we are done with all these things now we'll uh, continue in our next lecture then we will see deductions which are not allowed and these are also very important from examination point of view so let's meet in our next lecture till then bye bye and take care and also i would like to remind you also that please uh, go and start practicing your mcqs as well you can uh, go to the website they are freely available to you till then thank you so much bye and take care